please welcome Managing Director and an analyst, RBC Capital Markets, Mark Mahaney. Managing Director and Portfolio Manager, Jenison Associates, Natasha Kulkin. President, JetBlue Technology Ventures, Bonnie Simi. And Venture Partner, TCV, Eric Blatchford. In discussion with Skift Research Director, Luke Bajarski. Right. Everybody have a good break. All right. So we're going to talk about the, we're going to talk about investing. We're going to talk about the money. Uh, this is really a privilege to have this amazing uh, panel here today. We've been covering the internet players with Skift Research. So get it. these are the guys that and, and, and ladies that we come to to talk to when we want to know what's going on in the space, among others, of course. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much to the audience. Um, we're going to cover off uh, a, a lot of ground. We have 30 minutes, so just uh, hold on to your seats. But let's uh, start off and, 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 and kick it off and talk a little bit about uh, what makes travel an, an interesting sector to invest in. Um, and maybe, Mark, you want to kick it off? or? Sure. Uh, three things. Maybe keep three numbers in mind. First is $150 billion. That's the combined market cap of Priceline, Expedia, C-Trip, and TripAdvisor. So the public markets think there's a lot of there there. Second, it's less than 10%. I know Glenn said it at the beginning of the day, but um, each of these companies still accounts for less than 10% of all global room nights sold. So it's not like there's any 800-pound gorilla in the space yet versus the opportunity they're very... They're still relatively small, relatively small. And third is, these are highly profitable businesses. Uh, they generate 30 to 40% profit margins, and so they generate a lot of cash. So from an investor perspective, it's large, it's still got a lot of penetration potential, and it kicks out cash. That looks good to me. <laughs> hey, uh, there you go. that sounds... <laughs> okay, so, all right. Hi, guys. I guess I, I guess I would add that it's also this interesting industry where there's a ton of technology behind the scenes, right. and there's existing platforms, but there's tons of room for innovation still. Mm -hmm. And so it's still possible to grow companies that have got giant market caps. Right. You know, some industries, that, that's not the way it shakes out. Okay. Yeah, I'll build on that a little bit. There, we, I kind of look at in the threes as well. So if you, these emerging technologies, so the AI, machine learning, we've been hearing a lot about that, starting to get into virtual reality, augmented reality, they're starting to get uh, enough scale where co corporations are listening. And so what a startup needs is to have that market, particularly on the B2B side. So you have the tech, emerging technologies, you have the companies are listening and, and are willing to adopt some of that technology, and then you have massive amounts of infusion of cash. So we have lots of VCs. We have a corporate VCs such as, such as uh, JetBlue, and also there's a lot of money coming in from China. So right. entrepreneurs who are listening, this is a great time to start, and investors is a great time to invest. OK. Natasha? Yes. Yes? <laughs> OK. So if you haven't started, if you, have, if you haven't been in the travel business, though, mm -hmm. you know, Priceline's been like this for the last five years, Expedia's been like this, TripAdvisor's been like that. Is this a good time to get in? So I guess a simple answer is uh, yes. Um, the more nuanced answer would be that, yes, these stocks are up a lot along with the entire internet space. I think Priceline and Expedia year to date are up close to 25% versus the market that's up 10 to 12%. So clearly, they've outperformed. And if you look over the last couple years, um, the valuations have re-rated more to a normalized level. However, um, looking forward, uh, I still see sort of mid-teens mid earnings growth, maybe a little bit more for Priceline, maybe a little bit less for Expedia. But that's a pretty good return. I mean, I'll take that return any day of the week. Um, so. Uh, yes, I think that even today, these are really interesting companies to invest in on the public side. And Eric, you, you do later stage investing. Bonnie, you do more of the venture side. Mm -hmm. um, is this a good time to, 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 to do a travel startup? It, um, right now, uh, because there's so many companies, corporations that are thirsty to do these partnerships. I mean, practically every uh, hotel uh, company who was talking today, even in the restaurant area and in the airlines there, want to adopt 
we're talking AI, we're talking some, uh, some of the VR and AR. So this is the time, and it's through these vehicles, and whether it's in Silicon Valley, the incubators. So it used to be that incubators didn't take on travel companies, travel startups. Now there's whole sections of, of for, to help with the travel. And I think that's because of the success of Uber and Airbnb, quite frankly. Right. But investors want to see some, some numbers on the book first, right, mm -hmm. before you get any. Yeah, I mean, we're starting to see, because the, uh, the uh, startups are going very quickly from C to Series A, B, and C. And so that finding the right ones to jump on, uh, you have to get smart about the technologies. Um, but it's the, the, shrink, the time to go from early stage to C is very, very quick. Now, the exits are taking a lot longer. So where it used to be, you could get your 310X in a couple of years. Now, you know, the average ex exits are taking 10 years, right? IPOs are a lot longer. So there does need to be some more patience. And Eric Fogel was saying that, you know, the valuations are a little bit, bit lofty. Well, he's negotiating. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, okay. So do you think we're going to see a run then? Uh, you know, well, it's a, who knows, right? I mean, right now, I mean, what you've got is at the very early, early stage, I do a bunch of angel investing too, it, there's a lot of dead soldiers. It's, it's much easier to start a company than it has been in the past. It's really capital efficient, but it also means you find out really fast if it's going to work or not. And it's really hard to kind of get escape velocity to be good. And once you get to a company that, you know, a travel company that needs you know, 50, 100, 150 million dollars to grow, that company's established and you've got all the traditional kind of multiples you can apply. So, I don't know, valuation is, you know, companies are worth what people pay for them. Right, right. So, um, you know, those peaks, valleys, talking Priceline, Expedia, or are we looking elsewhere, C-Trip, or, you know, other players that are, you know, may not be as obvious these days. Um, you know, recent Trivago play, right? Clearly a different, different ball game, but um, you know, are we hitting a plateau with the, with the big guys, or are we still, still going strong? Plateau, no, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I thought that was the, you were gonna set it up for Airbnb, so I am gonna, I am gonna <laughs> swing at that pitch. Uh, the, um, <laughs> we'll talk about Airbnb for sure, yeah. Okay, then I'll hold off. You know, there, people always refer to these FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. I think it really should be PE FANG, Priceline, Expedia. If you really look at where the wealth creation is, all six of those names have been pretty much equal participants. And I know there's uh, Hotel Tonight is here. Uh, you know, that's a potential company we'll see in the public markets, the amount of public interest without pitching it for a name like Airbnb. Airbnb would be super high for a couple of those reasons we talked about earlier. No, I don't think we're at a plateau. Uh, and just keep in mind, you know, when people look at these stocks, you know, most of the economy grows at 3% and good S&P 500 stocks can maybe give you 7, 8, 9% earnings growth. And you've got some of these PE FANG names, you know, large platform global franchises, good management teams, and those are a lot of things you have to, that really have to come together, and they often, they usually don't, but occasionally they do, and they're great stocks, and they're sustainable for quite some time, and they deliver not 10, not 15, but you know, 15 to 20% or even higher earnings growth. That's rare air. Investors are willing to pay up for them for good reason. They're almost like secular growth utilities. You can count on them. That famous last words, but you can count on most of those stocks. Just to add to that, and that's at a time when the actual utilities, the staples names, looking more broadly, are trading at multiples that are, in some cases, higher than the FANG names. So companies like Coke and Pepsi and Clorox, which you would agree have you know, flat growth, or maybe in negative growth in some cases, are trading at multiples that are actually higher than the Googles, the Amazons, the price lines of the world. So it's not just those names that have seen significant appreciation. It's really been broad-based. Right, and, and you gotta be long the category, right? I mean, there's, I don't know, rough and tough, a billion new travelers in the next few years. I mean, it's just, as, as more and more countries, especially China, but there's, there's all over the world, as you see that wealth effect start to give people the, the time and the money to travel, everybody benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This, this, particularly the Southeast Asia and China, yeah. and as those, so as these platforms get, get into, the, it's harder in China, of course, but then you have Southeast Asia. That's an area that is gonna grow as they travel out of the region and travel the rest of the world. Right, and we'll get to, your, we'll get to Airbnb, but since we're on the China topic already, uh, you know, Eric, a former Expedia CEO, Priceline has a pretty sweet deal with C-Trip in terms of the inventory share. Expedia got out of the market a while ago. Is it game over for Expedia in China? 
No, no. I mean, you can't. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you, you can't. You can't really predict this stuff. I mean, China's tough, right? Uh, you want to have a partnership. You want to go in. I mean, back when I was there, actually, we did that investment in Elong. Uh, what was was the thing you're referring to? And you know, if you don't have people on the ground who know what's going on, you can find yourself in a pretty tough spot. And I, you know, I'm I'm sure the Expedia team is looking at the market, realizing there's going to be huge outbound flow. Uh, and, but, but you know, the huge domestic market too, which is just really hard to crack if you're not very careful. So you know, right. you just, you just got to look at that, I, I would think, cautiously. Right, right. And in terms of hotel inventory, I was interested to hear that uh, Wyndham just opened up its thousandth uh, property in China. Maybe the hotel players have a better leg up on, in, in China than the OTAs. Uh, what do you guys think? I think, I mean, I just, uh, I spent a week in China visiting with all the internet companies um, a couple weeks ago. And I think it's really tough, the domestic market for internet companies in China. I kind of feel like it's for domestic travel, I mean, different for outbound travel, different for, but for domestic, it feels like it's kind of game over for many of the US internet companies, including the travel space. It's just really difficult from a regulatory environment to operate in China. Mark, uh, what do you think in terms of C-Trip and WeChat? Is WeChat, you know, we're going to see travel inventory pouring through WeChat? Well, I didn't spend a week in China, <laughs> so I don't know those assets that well. What I'm struck by is what's called the China outbound market. So the single largest outbound market, that is people leaving a country and going some other place in the world, that's now China. And Glenn said this morning that Priceline is one company, has about 1,000 employees in China, three massive customer service centers. And um, so tapping into that, uh, you know, Priceline and Expedia have really been kind of um, outbound travel companies. That's probably what they should be called, uh, you know, cross-border travel companies. And so now you have this largest demo that there's this huge secular trend. It's not just internet usage, but it's the mid growing middle class and emerging markets that get a little bit of financial freedom and want to do what everybody else does, and they want to travel. And if you can tap into that market, and I think Priceline's pretty well positioned for this, and Expedia's behind, pretty far behind the curve, but maybe they can get some play on that. But it's a great part of the Priceline uh, long thesis, and it's a part of the C-Trip long thesis, that cross-border, that's when the real value of online travel agencies is, because you know if you live in Beijing, how do you know which hotel to stay at in, in Paris or in Lisbon, or if you're in Toronto, how do you know which hotel to stay in, in in Jamaica? Online travel agencies have a huge opportunity there, that outbound travel market, and the most attractive one is China. Right. And, and you, you sort of forget sometimes how big the numbers are. I mean, there's kind of a funny anecdote in the ski business. Um, so Beijing, sort of in an un unlikely way, has the 2022 Winter Olympics. And I guess the Chinese government said, we don't have enough skiers. And if anybody skis, you know those little magic carpet things where you're just learning to ski? Well, you can't actually buy any of them because they're all in China, and they're going to try to get 30 million new skiers on the hills in time for the Olympics so that there's a domestic audience for it. The, whole, the U.S. domestic ski market is 12 million skiers, <laughs> right? So, so you, you, sort of, you lose track of how the numbers are so enormous. Right. So given that scale then and the opportunity or lack thereof, how is that going to impact Priceline, Expedia five years down the road? You know, who, anybody's guess, but... Uh... And this is where looking at, again, the startups, and it is an area we've started to look at, is the cultural competency of startups here in the U.S. Uh, in terms of understanding the Chinese, understanding the Indian markets and such, because the outbound markets are going to be huge coming right. in here. And, uh, you know, it's too much of a challenge to invest in companies, at least at the early stage, that are based in China. It's just not a space we'd look at. But the ones that are building that competency here in the U.S. to receive right. those uh, travelers, yes. So, okay, so what about China going after the European market or the U.S. market? Does it even make sense for them? I mean, a Skyscanner acquisition, are we going to see uh, m more acquisitions there from, 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 you know, from the China players? I mean, I'm not a China expert, but clearly Skyscanner is... Uh, a formidable competitor in Europe on the meta side, and now they're going mm -hmm. direct. I mean, that's what they're thinking of. They're tr trying to turn that into an OTA, and it'll be interesting to see right. how that plays out, but clearly something worth watching. Right. I mean, listen, there's going to be big global players. There already are, and one of the big players, for sure, will be in China. I mean, it just seems mm -hmm. obvious. You know, so Skyscanner was a big opportunity. There's another name floating around out there, TripAdvisor. 
Mark, I know that uh, you know the, the cover. You, you do some extensive coverage on TripAdvisor with RBC. Is you just given the context, everything that's going on, the hotel brands are going platform. Everybody's going platform. What does that mean for TripAdvisor stock? And do you think they're an acquisition target? So TripAdvisor is an acquisition target. You know, maybe it's a very large global platform, 300 million uh, users, and a lot of people go there for the, they're at the top of the funnel. As everybody here in the hospitality industry knows, they're at the top of the funnel. And if you're in the hospitality industry, there's a ch decent chance you have one of those trip stickers somewhere in your, in the, uh, well, maybe not at certain hotels, but in it's, it's some hotels, they'll have the trip sticker as a badge of, uh, a badge of honor or what have you. Uh, but um, uh, TripAdvisor is a company that I think has been really uh, made some major mistakes in terms of product innovation. I think it's been sorely lacking, unfortunately, at that company. And it's reflected in what's happened with the stock price and in their fundamentals. And they haven't grown profits in three or four years. And that's a real tell in a secular growth industry. So I'm, I'm pretty cautious on, uh, on TripAdvisor. I, I think that, that could, they could probably use the strategic uh, acquisition. Somebody acquired them. I don't think Priceline is that acquirer. So it's... Um, I'm a little bit stumped as to who that would be. Google would be a natural candidate too, but there's no way in heck the government would allow that. So I don't know who the buyer is. And they have a very large shareholder in Liberty, so it'll be interesting to see if, when they actually become a seller, because doing a hostel on trip would be complicated, I think. Mm -hmm. I think they get a bad rap, <laughs> personally. I think they've got, a, they've got a pretty strong hand, and we'll see how they play it. Right, right. Okay, so I mean, it, the uh, just in terms of the Airbnb, right? I mean, they're going down the same road. They recently launched their restaurant bookings product with Resi. TripAdvisor has been doing it for a while. It seems like they're mimicking the model a little bit. So, is it all about execution? Is it all about the business strategy? Is it the model that's kind of off? What are the, you know? What's the, what's the big difference there? I mean, clearly. Airbnb is a lifestyle brand, but um, uh, what do you think, Bonnie? Is uh, in, you know what's the what's the big differentiator there? Well, I think what what customers are looking for is a bit more cross-platform. So with Airbnb going into whether it's the trip side or activities and such, uh, and TripAdvisor, you want to see, if you can keep your customers on one platform and meet several needs, it brings it just it keeps their eyeballs there. And so I think it's it, airlines are starting to think the same way. That's one of the things that we're doing is thinking across platforms. You know, you're not just a hotel company, you're not just an airline, you're not just an OTA. How do you across go across platforms? Right, Mark, should we expect? an Airbnb IPO this year or next year? I don't know about the timing of it, but uh, I think there would be a lot of interest in it. I think also Airbnb's done something. Um, we have any millennials in the house? <laughs> so what I think that Airbnb's had this dramatic appeal to millennials, but to other people too. We run an annual survey. Our results will come out later on this week, but um, it's no longer alternative accommodations. When we asked you know, a large number of US leisure travelers whether they used alternative accommodations, it's now 46% in our survey that said they had. When we started this a few years ago, it was low 30s. And so there's this dramatic move towards unique, differentiated, uh, 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 alternative accommodations that are no longer alternative. And uh, the leader in there, and it seems to be running away with it, is Airbnb. So um, they've got a bunch of different businesses they go, could go into. I think if they just didn't stick with that core business, uh, I think there's an enormous amount of growth ahead for them just in that uh, core business. And I think that's been wonderful product innovation to date. They got to keep that going. But I think there'll be an enormous amount of interest in it. I have no idea from a public markets perspective. I have no idea what the timing is, though. What about the legal implications there in terms of the regulations? Is that, does that pose an obstacle f for an IPO in terms of all the regulatory battles that they've been fighting at the city level? Is that going to slow things down? I mean, from my perspective, it would be great to see them um, settle some of those disputes just because the public market loves a little bit of certainty and going pub public with all of the regulatory uncertainty I think would be a little bit more complicated. Um, is it, is that the sole thing that's gonna keep them from going public? No, but I think it would be easier to buy it in a portfolio um, if we have some precedence of, of how some of these things get settled. Right. 
but it's part of their expansion too, right? So p doing expansion to other countries where the regulation, you know, think of the pretty bullish in moving into Cuba, for example, even. And it, it, that's ways to, okay, so you get shut down in a, well, this US city, okay, well then we're, we're gonna go to this international city and keep growing that way. I mean, we're an investor, so I, you know, I should be a little, little careful, but I, I would say it's, it's hard to know in the very short term how, how things shake out, but in the long term, look, the world's been reinvented, right? Now you go to a place and you could stay at a hotel or you could stay in somebody's apartment, and by the way, maybe the person is gonna take you on a tour of the great bakeries in the neighborhood. That's just not how it worked 10 years ago. I mean, so, you know, as the cohort moves through, right now you've got the sort of the first cohort who, who've sort of grown up, they've come into the travel market, and they're like, of course you go to a place and you can find a guide who takes you around the, sure you can. Well, nobody else used to do that. So Airbnb, I think it's, it's the sort of thing that once you get a whole generation that's used to doing things that way, I think it's a, a, really, a really big thing and that the regulation is gonna have to keep up with what people wanna do. I mean, so you have all these platforms, you have Airbnb, you have everybody trying to be a platform. What does that mean for Google as a platform, but also in terms of advertising, as an advertising channel, right? I mean, Priceline's Expedia spending an upwards of 80% of their ad budget on Google. You know, Skift Research, we looked at, looked at it, evaluated Google's business, you know, at 100 billion uh, in terms of ad revenue as kind of the, the sole portion of the business there is, I guess, the, the, the fundamental question there is search becoming waning in terms of its impact uh, from a traveler perspective and how might that, you know, impact the ecosystem, if anybody has any thoughts. Well, I'll just say that, I mean, I'm sure Priceline and the Expedia's of the world would love to be able to shift their budgets away from Google to another platform, but you know where do they go, right? So they've both tried and experimented with Facebook, and I think those are going well, but they're small. And the reality is, is that the intent on Google from a commercial perspective is like no other. And so I think there will be other channels. Meta is a big channel, but um, in the next several years at least, maybe voice will change all that, right? Yeah. But sort of as we see it today over the next couple years, I, I, I don't think it'll be that easy to shift away from traditional search until we see a new technology like voice. So this, this is where, you know, what is search? And it came out with, we have the internet and where you have Google. Where is search going to be? And this is the world that I live in is what's, what's ahead, you know? And, Voice uh, and you know who's owning voice search right now? Who's putting tons of investment into voice? That's Amazon. So the question is, could Amazon move into this space using the search of voice? And of course, Google is getting more and more into voice as well. Um, I see that as the next search platform. And how does that how does that change how you think about advertising? We see the the, the move on Facebook in terms of, uh, and YouTube is the advertising is now going into the short clips uh, on your iPhone, right, or your your digital devices, and so moving away from television. Right. Yeah, I mean you, you have to look at it. So. Um, there's a sort of a, a cap on how much you can really spend on the, the intent-driven stuff, right? If you're looking at your funnel, there's this point where somebody says, yes, I want to go to, you know, Mexico City. Okay, great. Everybody knows how to spend against that. And then what you say is, well, what about before that? What, when they're first planning, how do you stay top of mind for those people? And weirdly, we're, it's 2017, and it's still television. It's just weird, but it's true. And I would say the really interesting thing to watch is... Facebook's probably got better demographic targeting capability than television does, and it's got the broad reach because we're all on it. So does Facebook take a big chunk out of the television budgets for that sort of top of mind awareness, and how does that impact Google? I'm super interesting, five or six years coming. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you, you, can you ask Eric this question? <laughs> uh, which, which, which is that, uh, you know, Priceline and Expedia both created this, you know, they, they grew up on Google, and Priceline in particular, like, wouldn't be where it was without Google. Uh, Airbnb to date has been able to get where it is, not without too much help from Google, I don't think. Do you think in order to really, you know, get orders of magnitude larger, they have to use Google? Well, that's a great question, you know, and I, I, I guess I don't, I mean, Airbnb, the, the, the way they've basically built a, a, an accommodations brand, very similar to, uh, you know, Wyndham or the other brands we've been talking about, without actually owning the accommodation. I mean, it's this incredible capital-efficient model. 
um, people think of themselves as staying at an Airbnb. People don't, much as I love Expedia, people don't think of themselves as staying at an Expedia, right? There's another brand in there. And, and so that's, I think, the reason that the market, the word of mouth for them has been just, I mean, unprecedented. And it, it's that thing where they manage to brand the experience instead of the, the physical asset. Uh, and it's just, I don't know if it was strategy or if it just turned out that way, but that, that, that's the kicker, I think. That's good answer. Right. So going back to Facebook, though, we're talking about you know, travel competing against other sectors on Facebook, right? We're dealing with a completely different beast in terms of return on ad spend. Is it realistically scalable in terms of you know, having a channel that isn't only travel, but it's also you know, food and beverage, it's uh, everything under the sun competing for that same Mm, but that's where you get into, again, this, this, uh, the AI machine learning and knowing that you like to travel and right. maybe you don't. And so the, you know, we'll give you the, the stuff that to stay in your region and you get to travel. You know, the personalization, it just makes it dram it's not It's so much more uh, accessible because of those mm. technologies. Right, right. Mark, what do you think? I mean, actually, one thing I wanted to bring up, I remember Steve uh, Hafner at our Europe event said that, uh, said that what, what, what keeps them up at night is Apple flipping on their hotel functionality and basically uh, maybe tapping into booking.com or something, and then, you know, you know, what is that, you know, how does that impact? Do you think we'll see, like, an Apple getting into the travel space? Um, is it a matter of just flipping on a switch? Or they own the ecosystem, right? They got the iOS, they got the phone. Who can know? <laughs> no. I don't, I don't no. see it. Flat out no. I don't see it. <laughs> no. I mean, never they say never. They prove us wrong. I know, never say <laughs> but they, No. I don't, <laughs> they're, they're, they're also, making gadgets or what? You know, there, there's so many different, I mean, booking hotel rooms is one way to be in the travel business, but um, I, was, I was in Barcelona, and there's the Gaudi house there, and you get a little tablet when you come in, and it's an AR thing where you see how all the original furniture was and the paintings that were on the wall, and I thought, oh, an actual application of this technology, and I mean, it seems pretty clear that somebody like Apple could own that side of things, yeah. and I don't know how you monetize that exactly, but there's a lot more to this than, than just the booking. Yeah. So there's the, you know, what the facial recognition and what all that'll do, and where does that head into sort of some of the new technologies so yeah, Apple's playing in that, you know, Facebook doing um, in the whole virtual reality. Privatize Microsoft the TSA. Microsoft buying the What? Privatize the TSA. Who knows? Please. Yeah. <laughs> Bonnie's a pilot, by the way, if you, if you don't know. Yeah. So she, captain, right? Yes, Flying I commercial do, airlines do, in her spare I, I time. Uh, <laughs> pretty impressive. Um, I know, I'd love to get into the topic of, uh, of airlines. Sure. Um, in the meantime, if there are any audience questions. Yeah, I think one of the questions and one of the reasons why uh, JetBlue set up uh, a corporate venture arm in Silicon Valley, which is where we're based, is we think about what has happened. I'll use, since we've been talking about Airbnb, we'll use the hotel industry. And five years ago, so we have tried to think of five-year tr tranches. Five years ago, what were all of the major brands thinking about Airbnb? Eh, it's there, it's not going to impact us, et cetera. And now look where it's at. Same thing on the cars, and they weren't thinking Uber was much. So the question is, what's going to happen to the airline industry? Will the airline industry be disrupted? Now, our thesis is that, no, people will still go to, say, JFK or San Francisco to fly Transcon International. We do see, though, that the short haul, very short haul, 100, 300,000 miles, where there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Uh, there's a lot of other airfields, smaller gauge aircraft. We've invested in an electric propulsion aircraft, for example. That's 10 years out. But we have a seat at the table at this, these technologies. So we see maybe an open marketplace, perhaps. They're starting to pop a lot of startups on for charter aircraft. So we see that, that short, very ultra short haul to be disrupted. Great. Um, maybe some, some final thoughts. Uh, Mark, you want to start? And uh, mm -hmm. How would you summarize this conversation today? <laughs> or, <laughs> Help us out with that. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. What, what, what's, uh, you know what, what, what are you guys looking at right now? You guys cover the space. I mean, travel is w just one thing that, that you're looking at, obviously, as you look at internet. What, uh, you know, is travel becoming a lens that you know, helps us understand companies better. 
Let me, let me try this. Uh, I think about maybe four things that could, kind of up, from an investor perspective, that could upset the Apple cart. It's either maturity in the group, there's just so much online penetration that the growth slows down to single digit growth. That'll happen one day. I think that's a long ways off, but it's possible. Second is competition, as these companies increasingly swim in each other's lane, lanes. I doubt Apple gets in the space, but what do I know? You know? Maybe Amazon does, I really doubt it, but it's possible. Google could always come in, so there's that comp comp competitive risk. Third is regulatory risk, uh, you know, across. It's not just, they're not just going after Google regulators. You know, they may also do stuff with um, these companies. And you know, you've dealt with uh, local tax uh, municipalities. I mean, Dar was perfectly positioned to go to London. He spent, you know, I don't know how many years before that arguing with uh, New York City and San Francisco about taxes. He knows how to do that. So I think he'll do fine. And then um, the fourth one, though, is technology or, or disruption risk. And, and I don't know. I don't know whether voice does that or not, whether it really changes the winners in the space. It's possible it does. Uh, maybe AI does. I don't think so, but I just, you know, that's the wild card to me is if there's some yeah. sort of technology innovation out there, and those are two that come to mind that change uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the order of the winners. And that I'll, add the, I'll add one other technology is uh, what blockchain is now is what the internet was in 1995. And there were a whole lot of losers and winners in that early stage in the internet, and many of us didn't think that the internet was going to be anything. And then now, Expedia came along. So the question is, blockchain is very early. We're, it's too early necessarily to invest in, but it's definitely something to watch. Five years from now, this could be something that will be disrupting the travel industry. My summary? Travel is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys are awesome. Tasha. I mean, I guess from my perspective, when I look at these companies and we're public market investors, um, it's trying, the obvious thing on the travel names is they're maturing, you know, slowly maturing, right? But they are the public, the large public companies. We're, we are seeing some maturation just because the shift from offline to online is many years, you know, past. And um, so for, from my perspective, I guess we know, so it's clear that there's some maturation and it's really trying to figure out what that curve looks like. And that's the differentiating factor of how these stocks actually react. Is it, you know, sort of a very slow slope or is, it, is there something that's going to happen that's going to change that curve um, where these things just mature a lot faster than what we anticipate? And I think that's sort of the trick to owning these things over the next three to five years. Great. Well, we're out of time. Thanks so much, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you.